I said there were some things I needed to clarify because some people may be confused in what I'm saying. Do not confuse the date 36 AD with having anything to do with Christ's death or resurrection. 36 AD has much to do and is extremely important between 36 and 37 AD. Imagine the two most powerful men in Judea are removed. That's what I'm asking you to consider. Some series of events, both Caiaphas and Pilate, the two most powerful men in that area, are removed. Pilate is called back to Rome. Caiaphas is going to be replaced. Marcellus is installed as an overseer. He never held the position that Pilate had, and he only served for a year until Vitellius, the governor of Syria, installed a permanent fixture, if you will, that was on the same level as Pilate. So in that year, there is a tremendous amount of activity. What happens when the most powerful man sent by Rome is called back to Rome, and someone who really doesn't have that much power is just an overseer is installed who doesn't want to get into it with any of the people, doesn't want to have any uprisings, and you've got the most powerful religious leader who is now removed. And what you have is a recipe for a lot of unrest. Now, I said, don't confuse that and those dates with what I referenced about Christ's death. Here is the problem, and it's a huge problem. Anybody who studies the progression of the calendar we use, anyone, this is, you can go search this out for yourself. This happened in the Catholic Watch, in the Catholic Church, as the changes were occurring. There is a discrepancy of 10 years in the calendar somewhere. Don't ask me where, but this is chronicled. If you want to go look that up, it's well documented. Now, not in, not in our time, but somewhere back there, somebody made a mistake. Then you've equally got the discrepancy, we reckon things, B.C., A.D. The question is, for the Jews, they never stopped reckoning their time from their calendar, which, as I said, is 57-something, whatever the year is. They never switched to anything. There was no A.D. for them. So, if you're going to try and reckon something, you almost have to go back and try and reconstruct from their calendar, which has not changed. Now, there are flaws in their calendar as well, because they're starting their calendar under the auspices that whenever time began, or depending on which rabbi you read, it may be from the last day of creation forward, and there are those that believe that therefore believe that the earth is only 6,000 or however many years old. That was Bishop Usher's reasoning, counting from creation forward. I personally do not believe that the Jewish calendar starts at the beginning of time. I don't even think man was keeping track of time when, time be when, when, when Adam existed. I do not believe he kept track of time. God did that for him until the fall. That's just my opinion there. I'm sharing that with you. But what is the problem? And again, these are these challenges I put out to you so that you don't think I'm some nutbag coming up with things that, well, that's, that's confusing and novel. Go back and research what year Christ was born in. I challenge you, I know I've seen every commentary. No one has agreed on this. Some go by the reign of one ruler, and others go by certain other criteria. And no one has nailed that date down solidly. So, hypothetically speaking, at the furthest date away that some scholars hold, that in all possibility, keyword possibility, Jesus was actually born in 
6 or 7 or 7 or 6 BC, all the way down to the possibility of 3 BC. I said 4 yesterday, but it's actually 3. That's a huge discrepancy. So by the records we have, we know certain things and we can deduce certain things. Now, people will say, well, you can't, you can't play footsie with the date of Jesus' crucifixion. You can know this, that we have a solid date for Pontius Pilate's reign of 10 years. And his reign ended in 36, began in 26 to 36. So we can, there are certain solid markers that secular historians, not even Bible records and ecclesiastical history records, secular historians fix certain dates which are not to be moved. You can't play with them. They're set in stone. So we can know some things. We can know that in that 10-year ten, ten period, of course, that Pontius Pilate ruled, that Christ lived and was crucified somewhere in that reign. Now, it's not as large as 10 years, believe me. But when people say, well, it's 33 AD, where do they get this from? Where is it calculated from? Now, I'm, I'm not saying this to, to create issues. I'm simply saying that those very same people who want to dogmatically say 33 AD will be the very same people that will say he was crucified on a Friday. And as I told you, I don't say things randomly. There's, there's never... The way I, I see my responsibility is to take in as much information, to sift away a lot of the garbage, to sometimes present you with things that are really so outside of the realm, but I tell you that in advance, and come up with some solid We'll call them solid dots to connect. So, if people cannot be certain about the year in which Christ was born, how can you be so dogmatic about the year of his death? You can't. Now, if you read Josephus, and you're one of those people that wants to say Josephus is rock solid, he is rock solid, but I caution you on one thing. Any Josephus book that was printed after a certain year, and I, off the top of my head I can't tell you, but I will write it down and remember it so I can tell you next time. But any of the works of Josephus printed after a certain time, it's widely known that a lot of that work was altered. Surprise! I always say this, go, look, go search for yourself if you don't believe me. That's an absolute fact. So dates may have been altered, things may have been to fit or to alter, to, uh, to not lend credence in many ways to the Christian cause. Now, let's park that thought for a minute. What is important, and I've said this to you before about the fellow who wrote many books and held widely for many years the Wednesday-Saturday theory, and then he wrote a book and he changed his mind. And the issues in his book, if we were sitting in a courtroom, they would not hold up. Not because I want to be dogmatic. If you can show me something, and you can convince me from Scripture, and you can adequately present evidence from Scripture, you got my attention. But many of these people who hold these theories, the way they have to come to these theories is by using certain examples that cannot, they just cannot stick. If you read the Old Testament, Exodus and Leviticus will explain in, in great clarity, even though sometimes the King James doesn't make it plain, that the day for Hebrew reckoning Reckoning time began at 6 p.m. That's the reverse. For us, that's the reverse. We start our day, for example, at 6 a.m., and a day for us 
constitutes from sunup to sundown, not in Hebrew reckoning. So even Mr. Rudrow, who changed his mind, agrees that Hebrews reckon the time from 6 p.m. and that a day is, begins for the Hebrews at 6 p.m. This is why you will always read, even in modern Judaism, when they are about to celebrate a holiday, there's a Hebrew word, Erev, the eve of. They'll say Erev, whatever the holiday is, the eve of this holiday. And it fits perfectly in a Hebrew mindset, the eve being the hours before the day begins at 6 o'clock. So, if a Hebrew day is reckoned by beginning at 6 p.m., how some of these people have tried to make this fit, they're wanting to make this fit Friday, Saturday, and counting Sunday as a day, even though we know that he had to come out of the tomb Saturday after the Sabbath and before the sun came up, sometime in that window, cannot constitute a full day. And at best, if you were reckoning time the way the Hebrews reckon time, you would have 6 p.m. If you were going on traditional Friday, Jesus was crucified, died at 3 p.m. and was in the tomb, as we all hypothesize, by sundown, 6 p.m. before the Sabbath began. And you begin to reckon time, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. That's one day. That's not two days. And one day is not a day of daylight. Now, what happened with all of these commentaries, primarily things that streamed out of Maimonides and a lot of the Talmudic Midrashic tradition that began, you know, the, the, the Jews are very precise in many ways and very ambiguous in others. So at some point, you can read this in m many Midrashic commentaries, how the rabbis, probably beginning about the second century, possibly into the third, said that any portion of a day constituted a full day. Now, that's good for them, but does not fulfill what Christ said. Now, I'm using Woodrow's book as an example of something, because basically what he says is Jesus only said three days and three nights in one place when they came asking for a sign, and he said, there'll be no sign except the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the great fish's belly three days and three nights, so must the Son of Man, and so forth. You get that. I get that. Mr. Woodrow presents that as one versus every other time that Jesus spoke where he said three days and then. And his argument is that the three days and then, for example, in, in Mark's Gospel multiple times, uh, Mark 8.31, for example, where Jesus begins to foretell about his death. And you should see when I'm feeling good. And when Jesus begins to foretell about his death, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And so Mr. Woodrow uses this every single time to present the case that over, I believe, 20 Plus times Jesus says three days, but only one time in Matthew's gospel does he say three days and three nights. And the only flaw with his theory is that he did not consider who Jesus was talking to. All the times that he says after three days, he's speaking to his disciples. And the time when he said three days and three nights, he was responding to people that were seeking a sign that were not his disciples. Now, if you put that in perspective, the theory begins to fall apart just a little bit. And as you begin to chip, chip away at it, believe me, I'd, 
I want to fit in. I'd love to fit in. That's human nature. I just said a flesh expression. I'd love to fit in, but I don't. And I don't fit in because I can't fit in. Because when I read this book, I understand certain things that you cannot make fit into these traditional views. Now it staggers people. They cannot fathom how could this be, but just basic, basic mathematics, just basic counting. If he was buried on Friday, and we know that he came out of the tomb Saturday night after the Sabbath, but before the sun came up Sunday morning, that does not make three days, not even by the rabbi's reckoning. So I do this mostly for the benefit of new people who are listening, who may just be taken back by me saying certain things. You who have been around for years, you know most of these things. I don't want to leave the newer people out of the mix, so it's necessary for me to explain these things. Furthermore, the theory that is propagated by most of these people who hold to the Friday-Sunday resurrection is they will say that John, John's gospel cannot be reckoned with Matthew, Mark, and Luke because John says something regarding the day of preparation and the Sabbath. And here's where there's a little bit of a landslide for me, because I look at things differently. Mark was writing Peter's account. We know that. Peter did not feel the need to fill in as many blanks as maybe Luke uh, or, in this case, Matthew may have added some. The eyewitness, Peter, to most, not everything, but to most of these events, took a lot of things for granted, like we do when we're familiar with somebody, and we, there are certain things we just leave out because we expect, we're telling it like it's so sure in our minds, we, we don't say certain things. When you read Luke's Gospel, I say cautiously, we don't know anything. People have argued this for years. I have my own arguments. Luke was closely associated with Paul. And when you consider that he was closely associated with Paul, it's quite likely that Luke, after the fact, he could have been around for these events, but after the fact, he went back he says this in the opening of his writing, that he set out to put all things in order, to write all things down, and he sets out to get an eyewitness account to the best that he can. I'm sure he went around interviewing and talking to people to write what he wrote, which is staggering. But John's Gospel sits apart, and this is, this is the caution I ask people to exercise when they read. Don't say, well, because it's different, we have to jam it in or we have to discount it. Remember that John is writing from this mindset, the eternal perspective. He begins his writing within the beginning. He doesn't try and do what the others did with genealogies. He's talking about Christ who was from the beginning. And the Word made flesh that dwelt among us, he says. So his writing, a little bit different, and I would almost go as far to say Luke did not have the Jewish eyeballs that John did. So I really don't think that when John set out to write, his writing writing as he did, whatever he put down, was from, he, from that mindset. Sabbath and day of preparation, and hear me out carefully, need to be considered properly in John's Gospel. Why? Because for Jews who celebrated the Sabbath, and even today, people who are celebrating the normal Sabbath day, even in modern Jewry, have already set in motion, as this is what they've done their whole life. There's really nothing special for them to do. You talk to any practicing Jew today, and I say practicing Jew, 
they'll tell you they have a routine that they do and their routine is quite set. They don't work on the Sabbath. Normally they fix their food Friday night before the Sabbath. It's set on the stove and that's their food until the end of Sabbath. They don't cook or prepare anything. There is no preparing for the Sabbath because that is, that's an integral part of your life. So people who do not read from a Semitic understanding will say, well, of course, they were preparing the Sabbath. They were getting ready for the Sabbath. But for Jews, practicing Jews, which these were, this was a regular routine of their life. So John is giving us an indicator of something that is not as normal and as routine as the regular Sabbath. Now, naysayers will say, well, you didn't prove anything. Go back and read how John presents certain things that to a Christian, Gentile or Christian, you would miss, but to a Jew it would be obvious. I'll give you a perfect case in point. We ponder the foot washing. What does this mean, really, that Jesus humbled himself to be a servant? What is the true meaning? We as Christians search for the true meaning. The Pope will wash people's feet, and we say, look at how humble he is, and he you know, got a bunch of stinky feet in front of him, and he's washing their feet, and it's the most humble act. But ask a Jew what this ritual meant, and they'll tell you, this is Passover week. This is part of the preparation. And any Jew will tell you they had ritual washings. Now, I cannot say that I understand perfectly this foot washing, but I do understand the concept of ritual washing during Passover in preparation for the Passover that is customary even today in modern Jewry. We as Christians would not see that and understand it, but when you read John's Gospel, that many chapters, I think I referenced this a couple of weeks ago, many chapters occur, that's one week, many chapters of John's Gospel is really happening inside one week, which is staggering because we read it in its pages upon pages and detail and detail and detail in one week. So John was focused on telling us certain things about that week that we don't get anywhere else. And from a Semitic understanding, you can see John is weaving in certain things that would have been customary or tradition for that time, including, I'll go to the Last Supper. And again, from a Christian perspective, we have images of the fantastic painting of the Last Supper, how the table was long and spread out. That's the way we normally see the Last Supper in all of its depiction. But generally speaking, in the traditional practicing Judaism of that day, the table was at least half round or people sat in a semicircle and the person who was the prominent figure, the father of the family or the one who slaughtered the Passover, but it was usually the elder or father of the family sat at the head of the table. These are all important. This is why I study the Jewish uh, records to understand better, to not read this with blinders on, but to better understand what was custom to these people in that day. We read about sopping and dipping, and we think, wow, that's kind of freaky. But if you understand how the Passover meal and how perhaps they celebrated it then, it's not so weird. So there are all these things to consider, but I, I went off on a tandem here to talk about customs and traditions, and I want to digress to talking about these three days and three nights. Now, by Jesus' own mouth, he said three days and three nights to those who were seeking a sign. Now, who did Jesus raise up for? Who did he show himself to? His disciples. We could say from their vantage point it would have sufficed that he just rose up from the dead anyway. For the Jews, he had to be dead for three days and three nights in order to be certifiably dead. 
So don't go trying to cheat and stuff things down people's throat because that's tr the tradition that people have just propagated. They've just, they have just lived by this because their fathers and their grandfathers and it's just been passed down. And the church, the worst offender perhaps, the Catholic Church, just keeps perpetuating it and nobody asks, just like Christmas. Nobody cares to even want to disturb this sacred holiday. That's why I tell you when I listen to these evangelists on TV say, Christ is the reason for the season, and we're talking about Christmas time, I just have to scratch my head and think, okay. I mean, I celebrate Christ all year round. He is my reason for being. I'm, I have a purpose because of Him. But don't force me to swallow your ideas when in examining the scriptures it becomes abundantly clear there's nothing that we cannot glean from even the smallest details now we'll have to examine that what John was pointing out that everybody would like to cover up it's quite important now if you were preparing for the Passover you'd have preparation now here's Here's a good one for you. You're going to like this because no one has answered this, what I call the Rubik's Cube of Scripture. Maybe no one cares to. In Matthew 26 and verse 17, some of you are just going to hate me for this. Now the first day of the feast, you see those two words are italicized, added by the translators, now the first, so we'd be reading now the first of unleavened bread, but it was undoubtedly the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying unto him, where wilt thou we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? Do you see a problem? Now all the people who would like to sell you on the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we'll skip right over this. If you read in Leviticus and in, there are, there are two other passages, and I don't want to be sitting here thumbing for them, so hopefully I can find it quickly for you. Here we go. I'll just read. You stay where you are. The fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Go back and read that. Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Do you read it? Yeah. Did you ever see that before? Yeah. So what on earth does this mean? Because obviously Mark's putting the, the order technically speaking, is out of order. What does this mean? Oh, boy. Don't you hate when I do that? Well, I might tell you tonight, and maybe not. Depends on if you get the phones busy. Get busy. Do I like dangling? Yes. What I like most, most about this is that it really does reveal how we can just read by things and not pay attention. That's, that's, what, that's the complacency and the familiarity I'm talking about. Now, this will come up in a message, so don't think I'm abandoning. It's probably one of the most important things that we can set straight is the chronology. If Jesus fulfilled all of the set times and that's what we need to be concerned with remember we're going from what God says early on for generations and when he said that he meant it and the generations into eternity because if Christ fulfilled these set times they are fulfilled in him and will continue for generations. Now, 
I changed subjects. I've been trying to get to this book. It seems like for many weeks I've just passed this book by. This is uh, a 1940s printing of the Jefferson Bible. And before I read the contents to you, and I won't read the whole thing, but I would like to read what the editors, or the publishers rather, had to say. And you will be quite surprised. Thomas Jefferson, the father of American democracy, selected the words of Christ and Christ alone. He selected them from the Bible for his own use. He clipped and pasted them in sequence in a blank book, and in doing so wove the most simple and exquisite story ever told, the life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth. Here's the clincher for me, though, because all of that's kind of scary. This is the clincher. The editors, I can't believe, or the publishers, I can't believe that they would write this. This book is the very epitome of the entire Christian faith. There's only one problem with that statement. Would you like to know what it is? No. This is how, what did I, let me read that again. This book is the very epitome of the entire Christian faith. And this is how Thomas Jefferson's Bible ends. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. Now there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus, wound it in linen cloths and with spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein, never, wherein was never man yet laid. There they laid Jesus, rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher, and departed. Let me read the publisher's words once more. This book is the epitome of the entire Christian faith. That had to be some heathen writing that, because Paul picks it up quite plainly in the New Testament. If Christ be not risen, our faith is vain. Now you know, I've told you this before, and I'm sure some of you know this from studying Bible history, but he did not, Jefferson did not believe in miracles, so any miracle was taken out of this Bible that he made. And uh, you take the miracle of the resurrection out of the Bible, and you have a dead man with lots of dead promises and no hope at all. Now, I share this with you because this this little book, believe it or not, is the perfect example of why we need to study these, and they are difficult subjects to study. Cannot remove the miracles. As I said, Christianity begins with a miracle. And this is the mystery of it all. If you're willing to write a book and take the miracles out, then I guess Thomas Jefferson had to conclude that Jesus was just a man, because virgin birth? Now, to me, it's pretty simple. If God could penetrate a closed virgin womb, it's no big deal. If you can cross that hurdle, then you can cross the other one, that he came through the stone, through a sealed tomb, and not only showed himself, and I love what Luke says, by many infallible proofs, and ascended. But you can pretty much, if you're willing to take the time, you can pretty much walk away saying, you can't 
bifurcate, you can't disseminate, you cannot remove the miracle, because that is our faith. He rose. Now, the greatest thing I can tell you about that is on days when I consider the time that remains in front of me, and I consider the past behind me, if it weren't for what he did at Calvary in laying down his life and doing exactly that which Paul says, he became obedient unto death. That act gives me the hope of what's behind is forgiven, what's in the present is forgiven, what's yet to come is forgiven, and the certainty that when he said to his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you, that we're not just placed in a tomb or placed in the ground and nothing more, as some would have you believe. So I celebrate every opportunity to open up the scriptures and talk about this miracle, which is at the core and center of our faith. If you'll take the time as I'm doing, and over the years I'm sure you have, it is that absolute certainty that no matter what is going on, you have an anchor of the soul in Jesus Christ. Everything else may move, but that one anchor is sure. Get on the telephone. Well, let me clarify two other things. Do not think I contradicted myself when I spoke about the amount of spices, aloe and myrrh, brought for Jesus' body. And there's something very distinct in this. As I said, an average person like Lazarus undoubtedly had the normal standard amount of 20 pounds put on him. And hence the expression, it's four days and he stinketh. He's probably decaying already. Now, an excessive use over the normal amount, they, they would apply it to the linen. These spices were applied to the linen and then they could be, the body would be wrapped and then they would put the excess sometimes on the top. We can imagine how much excess there would be with what Nicodemus brought. But the same principle that would help the body to decompose in a lesser amount, in a greater amount would actually, in many cases, help to preserve it. And I want you to think about um, what he brought, uh, aloe and myrrh. Have you ever had a burn? You had something happen to you and you put aloe on and it helps to heal your skin. Now, I guarantee you that this is not some, um, you know, error here, but if you think about how much was placed on Jesus' body and you combine what is said, Jesus didn't need these spices to preserve his body. The scripture says that God wouldn't allow his Holy One to, to see, to, for his body to see corruption. Speaking of when he was placed in the grave, not speaking of sin, speaking of when he was placed in the grave, nor did he see, nor did he have sin in him. But what's important is I think people can get confused. If you use a little bit, it helps to help the body to decompose, controls the smell, but it actually helps in the process of basically the, the degeneration of the body. Um, in excess, it would act more as a preservative. So you've got these two balances there. Um, likewise, I think people will go right over this as well. When they offered him um, that gall, and that was given to people who were in terrible pain, we'll call it their form of narcotics. And there's very good reason why Jesus would not take it. If you think about it, no man Again, no man lays, takes my life, I lay it down to myself. He would not have, essentially, the, the scriptures couldn't be fulfilled if he had partaken of that in the quantities that people did to, to quell the pain of what he was suffering. 
It'd be like saying, I can't sleep, give me a sleeping pill, versus I will go to sleep. That, that's all necessary, anything that would tamper with or alter what the scriptures required. So there are these things that people will go right over. Um, I was discussing with somebody a couple of weeks ago. It was a very interesting conversation, to say the least. Um, this person hypothesized. Their theory is that not one drop of Jesus' blood ever fell to the ground while he was on the cross. And their theory is that angels caught the blood in cups. Um, the, the only issue that I, I have with that is we read of how that spear pierced his side and out came blood and water. And you realize, again, it's these theories that people will come up with. The blood and water came out. Now, I don't know. I wasn't there. I can't tell you if somebody was... For you people on radio, I cut my hands like I was trying to pick up the drops. But I can say this. Um, in mentioning that spear, I do find it interesting that people will discount all of that, the spear of Longinus, and say, well, you know, that's, that's just lore. And I, I really, based on what I have read over the years, I really honestly do believe it's now been verified. Uh, you know, Hitler's interest in the occult and his quest for uh, things that he believed possessed power of some kind. And I do believe, by the way, that that uh, spear that's on display was made by, it was either a Chinese or a Japanese uh, forgery that was made, and they did, indeed, it's on display. They claim that it's the spear. I don't believe for a minute, based on the things we know, that if they ever had that spear, that it would have ever been put on display anywhere. And most of the things that people say disappeared, I believe they disappeared somewhere, like a lot of the artwork that's now just surfacing. Um, and they've, over the last maybe 15 or 20 years, have found at least three large caches that then the debate comes of tracing it back to the families of, of whom these belongings obviously were seized uh, at that time. There's very good reason to believe that they sought out and searched for relics. Why not? The Catholic Church has done that. Uh, from the beginning, beginning with Helena, and uh, just keep following all the veneration of everything that's in the Catholic Church. Why not? Now, do I believe everything about what is told about the spear? Not necessarily. But I do believe that there was indeed a quest for it, and I do believe that they brought a, a, a person to either recreate or forge, which, as I said, that's what's on display. Do I believe that all of these things made their way to uh, some remote location somewhere in the Arctic or Antarctica or something? It's possible. I'm not going to tell you that I would bet my life on it, but I do believe that a lot of these things disappeared and they were, they were placed somewhere by Hitler. I believe that for certain. And I believe over time some of these things, whether they be the true or replicas, we won't know. I believe they'll eventually, like a lot of artwork and other things that have surfaced over time, I believe will surface. Will that prove anything? No. Because, again, I've said this many times, this is why, to me, archaeology is fascinating, but I don't build my faith on anything that is found in the ground or an artifact or some item that's been venerated. My faith is coming right from this book. That's where my faith is settled. So um, I introduce some of these things because they're of interest to me, but they're, they're greatly on the edge. And um, when people make 
hypothetical statements, or maybe they base their faith on this, that not a drop of Christ's blood fell to the ground. I just, I'm reading the scriptures and reading that his side was pierced, and obviously if his side was pierced, it also means that blood came out on that spear and went somewhere as well, whether the soldier cleaned it immediately or stuck it in the ground or whatever he did with it, it went somewhere, which means not all the blood, even that theory can, whew, this clean house on theories tonight. But it's certainly good to present everything and opens the mind to consider that we don't have a full record. I, I brought this, but I will not read it tonight. I won't get around to it. Um, this is the New Testament Apocrypha. And the Gospel of Nicodemus, there's all kinds of really far out there writing, obviously done at a much later time, uh, certainly done uh, without a doubt in my mind. This had to have been done after at least a portion of the Gospels were circulating. That, that's a no-brainer based on how much scripture is, is being quoted and uh, the publishers of this translation took the liberty to italicize all of the scriptural quotations so you can see how much scripture is in there. So undoubtedly, it's much later. Um, and many things that are hypothesized are, or, or of course it's apocrypha, uh, are at best legendary, uh, and maybe in some cases to be gleaned from as a hypothesis. So you take all of it into consideration. I, I still say I come back to the Bible. That's my main source. But you take all these things into consideration, and then you begin to sift away. And what you end up ultimately with is the truth that never changes. You who are listening out there who never call in, I know who you are. I'm watching you. I want you to call in. And let me know you're listening. It encourages me. Some of you old king's houses out there that are just still stewing in your brood, you better figure out that, yeah, even your phone calls could encourage me. So I suggest you all get every single phone busy. Come on, get on the telephone. <laughs> This house, magnify the Lord, lift up holy hands, our hearts in one accord, worship and bow down before Him.